Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the Horus Heresy Lore Breakdown. We are now on book number 30, David Annandale's The Damnation of Pythos. <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy indeed. This book is going to be an interesting departure from previous entries into the Horus Heresy series, if nothing else. A, um... I suppose the best way we can describe it is a radical experiment in 40k storytelling that may or may not have worked out quite as well as the writer may have hoped for. But before that, we have another sponsor this week. It is your favorite Raid Shadow Legends, the dark fantasy RPG for your mobile or PC with 600 champions spread across 13 factions. And today, we are going to have a closer look at one of them, namely the Dwarves. Like all truly enlightened civilizations, they are staunch isolationists and firm fans of a caste system to boot. For ages, they were able to keep to themselves communicating and trading with the lesser, beardless races only when absolutely necessary and even then only via special diplomats and envoys. Tragically, however, their beautifully stratified society, consisting of delvers, craftsmen, nobles and priests, was nearly destroyed by a demonic invasion. The stubby little Sunties did pull off a narrow victory, but at a great cost in dwarven lives. And the king, like all true dwarves, decided that vengeance is a dish best served frequently, and in the broken and burning homeland of your enemies. In the pursuit of this noble undertaking, the king mobilized his army and marched up onto the surface to join the other beardless races in their war against demon kind. In game, despite being a later addition to Raid, the dwarves already have a sizable roster, including, of course, the Mountain King, making a well-considered and clear fashion statement with the ginormous horns attached to his helmet, blocking out all peripheral vision. This to ensure that there is only going forward for the highest of dwarven nobility. And fear not, whilst dwarf society is highly stratified, even the lower classes like the Serving Wenchers have access to adequate protection via armoured hair buns. Hey, when you can't afford a helmet, you need to make some creative choices. And speaking of creativity, I've been enjoying the PvP multiplayer aspect of Raid Shadow Legends recently having through a great deal of trial, error, lots of error and testing, made my way up to the Gold Arena, the highest of the three levels of the classic PvP arena, using Calibalax to place a bunch of AoE poison dots on the enemy and then having Xavier blow it all up. It seems to be working pretty well so far. On the news front, we have a new rotation of the Doom Tower, with two new bosses, Astronix the Dark Fae and Bommel the Dreadhorn, along, of course, with freshly rebalanced encounters on the tower's 100 floors and new secret rooms as well, with new shards for new champions and, most interestingly of all, the addition of the Super Raids feature allowing you to pay twice the normal energy cost for twice the rewards, double the rating in half the time. There's never been a better time to join Raid Shadow Legends. You can click on the link in the description below to gain 200,000 silver, one XP boost, one energy refuel, and one ancient shard, along with access to the epic hero Shinuru. Uh, these rewards will be found up here in your inbox for the next 30 days, and is an offer exclusive to new players. The Damnation of Pythos. <laughs> I have a sneaking suspicion that um, a very large percentage of people watching this video are not here for the little lore tidbits, few and far between though they may be in this book, or the book itself, but rather my reaction to it, because as mentioned, this is a 
radical departure from the rest of the Hollis Heresy to the point where it might as well not even exist in the same universe as the rest of the Horus Heresy. This isn't like the, um, what was it, the, the Hunt for the Abyss or something like that? The one sent around the Furious Abyss. The grandest, biggest, chunkiest ship ever imagined, and yet still built in absolute secrecy within parting distance of terror. <laughs> oh, Custodes, why? <sighs> I hate what the Horus Heresy has done to the Custodes. I really do. I just... <laughs> I mean, the Fear is Abyss thing was stupid enough, but the real stinking, semi-soft turd laid upon their golden armor has to, of course, be Lorgar. Oh, Jesus. <sighs> Custodes communication with Terra. Frequent, continuous check-ins to make sure that they are, you know, still alive is successfully copied and spoofed by a half-mad demon thing nailed into the goddamn hull based upon the corpse of a dead astropath. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <sighs> Never mind either the fact that they built two more fears of this. Is, oh. Let's... Let's just move on from all of that, shall we? And uh, back again to the damnation of Pythos. I mentioned the whole fear is abyss thing before I got sidetracked about the custodies again, because that is a book that at the time I argued and have argued again and again later that the book just didn't need to be written. It has no place in the wider Horus Heresy, and the time used on that book, the amount of pages, and the installment in the Horus Heresy would have been far better spent on uh, anything else, really. Maybe a bit of a building up chapter before Scars, showing us some of the divide inside of the Legion, or maybe they could use the time to transition Horus a little bit more from noble leader to batshit insane genocidal lunatic. That'd be good. Or maybe a little bit more attention could be given to Ferris Manus or the Iron Hands, maybe. You know, anything rather than the Ultramarines stopping a thing that turned out to not be a threat to absolutely anybody and whose only <laughs> lasting legacy in the Horus Heresy is creating a wreck that slowly orbits Ultramar, for Gilliman to look up at and go, Ah, oh, yes, that would have sucked if anything had actually happened, before moving on to his own plot line surrounding the Pharos Beacon. But at least that book had a tangential connection to the Horus Heresy, Pythos, again, I'm not exaggerating when I say that it might as well take place in an entirely different universe from everything else. But anywho, let's actually get started, shall we? The book begins by introducing us to Atticus, a legionnaire of the Iron Warriors. Oh, oh why? Right, that's, that's right, that's... That is actually correct. I had completely forgotten that this book was about the Iron Warriors. <laughs> I complained so recently about how the Iron Warriors get basically no attention, and here we are on a book that I have read, and I, the only... See, this is the thing as well. This, this is a bit of an indication right here. My only memory of the Damnation of Pythos is absolute abject confusion. I, well, foreshadowing 101, eh? Anywho, Atticus is one of the Iron Tenth's leaders. Um, he took a great deal of damage during their battle together with the Emperor's children before the Emperor's children turned traitor. You know, the battle in which uh, Ferris Manus sacrificed a great deal of his own flagships. Uh, armor, and in turn Logans, and many things, to rescue Fulgrim. It was a uh, dark day in the Legion's history, but of course compared to Istvan, it was nothing. And the Iron Tenth is... 
well, not dealing well with the consequences of Istvan. Atticus is in command of the Veritas Ferrum, a strike cruiser that was able to escape Istvan relatively intact meaning that he is luckier than most iron warriors, or indeed salamanders, or raven card, or loyalists in general. But that, if anything, only makes it worse, as they are now frightfully aware that despite the fact that they do have some force, and indeed more force than most loyalists right now, they have absolutely no chance at striking out against the traitors. They are the scattered remnants of a defeated legion, essentially. And why they don't go so far as to actually use the word defeated, the Iron Hands more or less admit as much. There is an interesting metaphor to begin with, where Atticus is musing over his recent transformation. Uh, during the battle alongside the Emperor's children, the Veritas Ferrum had taken a savage beating, and Atticus had been... well, nearly killed straight up, and has now had a lot of his body replaced with bionics. He talks about how, when the inferior substance is scarred, it must be repaired by a superior one. Referring, of course, to the Iron Tenth's creed that the flesh is weak, but iron is strong. But no amount of iron is going to fix the hurt that the Legion suffered at Istvan. It's interesting, because it, again, this is why we desperately need some more iron warriors. Warriors? Iron hands. I wonder how many times I'm going to make that mistake. Frequently, I'm thinking. Why we desperately need some more Iron Hands books? Simply because it's very interesting. They are an unbending legion. One quite firmly convinced of their own superiority, and the fact that they are stronger for sacrificing the weak flesh. Yet now, of course, so much of their flesh has been sacrificed that... They're wondering whether or not they are even truly a legion anymore, whether they are really a fighting force, whether they have any power at all. What iron could possibly be built or grafted to the legion to replace their casualties now? Hmm. Interesting indeed. And of course, whereas the legionnaires are struggling to find meaning, salvation, a reason to go on, since well, their only real reason at the moment is vengeance, a vengeance that they know they can't carry out against a far stronger foe, the mortals of the crew have already found their salvation. As there is a growing and already substantially sized cult of the god emperor, the Lectitio Divinitatus. Oh yes indeed. We get an interesting little conversation between one serf and another, where the believer tries to hand the non-believer a copy of the Lectitio Divinitatus that she was given by a word bearer. <laughs> Now, this person is highly regarded in the surf uh, community, a mother to them all, apparently, and that is the only reason I can imagine why the other surf doesn't immediately shout traitor, traitor, traitor at the top of his voice and start calling for legionnaires to come and kill the person. Because, again, the word bearers have hardly got the best of reputations with the iron hands right now for self-evident reasons. There is also an interesting little mention, because obviously he goes, wait, you got this from a word bearer? You know they're the, the, the bad guys, right? <laughs> you are aware of this. And she simply says, yeah, yeah, no. It's uh, tragic that those who saw the truth first have now turned away from it. Alrighty then. Very well. There's also a uh, mention of the whole thing that the God Emperor, of course, rejects his own divinity, which Logar as well was like, oh, he just does that to be funny. <laughs> right. And she has pretty much the same view, in that this is a test from the Emperor. He has presented them with a paradox. There are no gods, says God, and you must be able to see through this to 
get to the real truth behind it. I mean, it's, it's certainly religious in origin, you know? Well, this isn't real. Ah, oh, but you see, that's a test. <laughs> God wants to make sure that you can look at the thing that isn't real and go like, Oh yes, that's totally real. <laughs> Faith. An interesting concept, is it not? I mean, on the one hand, in modern day religious circles, you could make the argument that we don't know if God is real or isn't real because, well, it's kind of difficult to prove, really. But if your actual literal God tells you that he isn't a God, well, uh, then again, double think is hardly a heredity in this day and age, so I'm sure that this isn't all that unusual. I mean, hell, if we can create non-religious religions, why can't we believe that a god that says he isn't a god is a god? I see no particular reason why this should uh, worry anyone. And speaking of uh, feelings and emotions, reactions and so on, there is a strange draw to a certain place in the warp. The astropath of the ship feels as if she needs to go to a specific area as if the warp is dragging her towards a planet called Pithos. Go to Pithos. She describes it as a temptation, which is an interesting term, as if the warp is trying to seduce her to go there. Like, okay, you come here and we will reveal everything. A beckoning call. Not at all a warning, then. That's going to be potentially important for the future. Instead, an enticement to head towards whatever it is that's speaking to her. Eventually, they arrive to this planet. Uh, she simply explains to the Space Marines that she doesn't know why she needs to go here. She even learns to explain as well that she has certain senses that serve her instead of her eyes, and she doesn't understand why. She demonstrates this by sidestepping a, um, a wooden trunk in her path, and she explains that I didn't see the trunk, I didn't smell or hear the trunk or any such nonsense. I was simply informed by my senses that the trunk was there, and so I should avoid it. Apparently, Pythos is doing something along the same things to her. Although when the uh, Snarties actually arrive, they are not given quite so welcoming a uh, exception. As when they begin to scan the planet, the ship is overloaded by some kind of backlash causing the death of one of the Astartes on board, and this is perceived as a hostile action, as if something down on the planet attacked them. And so the Astartes obviously respond in kind with a full-scale invasion, yet they found no civilization, no sign of any Xenos civilization, no human civilization, no population at all, in fact, beyond loads and loads of trees. A world overrun by life, as it is described by the Iron Hands. And this is where the book transforms into Jurassic Park as the Astartes find a bunch of herbivores. Or at least they should be herbivores, as pointed out by the salamander. There is no way they could possibly be effective predators. Seconds before the non-effective predators begin tearing apart fully armoured space marines. <laughs> it strikes me that nothing in the 41st millennium isn't able to rend apart power armour. Making me question why they even bother, frankly. But the herbivores are but the least of all the grand threats that this horrible little planet has in store for our heroes. The next and far greater threat is, of course, moss. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> this is an actual spoony skit. Ah. <sighs> And of course, all of these horrible monsters, more than capable of killing fully armoured space marines, all of these attacks and violence and bloodshed and horror is presaged by the astropath looking at the closest of Astartes and going, 
Well, I have a bad feeling about this. <laughs> Which I feel like she could have mentioned before they went down to the planet, but oh well, minor details. And to be fair, the mistress of astropaths would probably not have been listened to, even if she told everyone to not go down onto the planet. After escaping the flesh-eating moss, <laughs> right. Um, after escaping the flesh eating moss, the Space Marines rally and the Raven Guard. I said Salamander, didn't I? I, I, say, I did say Salamander. The Raven Guard was the one that pointed out that the monsters looked like herbivores. And he further explains this, that everything from their build to their pack habits to their behavior, all of it suggested that they could be nothing but herbivores. But now that he's been on the planet for longer, he's seen the monsters, he's seen the moss, and he's been able to observe the environment, he has a conversation with Kidem the Salamander, where he points out that everything on the planet they've seen so far is carnivorous in one way or another. Even the plants appears to prey upon other creatures as their primary source of nourishment. Oh, it is, of course, ridiculous. Now, Kidem, being a salamander, comes from a world that is basically shrouded in volcanoes, and yet he, too, is like, even on Nocturne, there was a certain balance. There were prey animals for the predators to prey upon. There were things for the prey animals to eat that weren't, you know, other living things. There were, well, food for herbivores. Yet here, everything is killing everything, apparently for simple survival. Now, that should not be possible, certainly not naturally, which is, of course, all the hint they need. So this planet is not natural, which leads them again to assume that they must be up against some kind of intelligent foe, despite, again, having found absolutely no sign of any habitation. So what kind of an intelligent foe then becomes the pressing question. But it's not like either of the two Allegioners have any real say in the matter. The Iron Hands are the ones in charge here, and they have decided that the intelligence this planet can possibly provide outweighs the risk. The intelligence, of course, being clarity for their mistress of astropaths, who again claims that the planet is somehow speaking to her on that deeply instinctual levels? That's not the right word either, really, but anywho, every time she's followed these instincts, for lack of a better word, it's been a good thing. And if indeed the planet can provide clarity to reach out into the Immaterium, to look into it, to uh, pass past the storms currently shrouding the Imperium, that would be incredibly valuable. The ability to see the traitors' fleets, the ability to harry them effectively, the ability to communicate this information to other loyalist forces, and so on. A potential game-changer, absolutely. The mistress of Astropath Irefron leads the band of space marines towards her objective, and they arrive near some weird-looking ruins that are described as, um, as if you can't look at them too long, as if the eyes simply glide off them. Hmm. Very chaosy sounding, that. There is also a mention that they are being surrounded by hostile creatures coming up behind them, yet again suggesting some kind of controlling intelligence behind the monsters on the planet. And quite some monsters, too. Eight meters tall T-Rexes capable of jumping two meters up into the air. <laughs> righty -o then. See, I'm starting to see what the Raven card was talking about when he said that this world shouldn't be this way. I mean, and, and pack hunters as well, as there are apparently some 20 of them. 28 meters tall? <laughs> Dinosaur monsters. 
I mean, how much food must they need to devour? A pack of these every day just to live. <sighs> well, they get to fight space marines now, and for once, their teeth do actually crack on ceramite, at least yeah, some of them. The rest of them still bite through the reinforced ceramite, but at the very least, there is a small concession to the fact that these are goddamn space marines wearing ceramite armor. On this occasion, armor plus bolt guns are, however, enough to fight off the pack, since there was no vicious moss to contend with, of course. And after having seen them off, they move on into the spot located by their mistress of astropaths. She directs them to the area she needs to be in, and asks the Astartes to erect a fortress, a defensible structure, upon it. Now this is a little bit away from the ideal position, but that was the one the eight meters tall T-Rexes were circling, so... It is a reasonable compromise to maybe stay a little bit away from the apex predators of the planet. Uh, to add yet further misery to the situation, however, all of the dead Astartes had to be left behind, lest the pack surge in again and overwhelm the rest of them, meaning that all the dead would have to have their progenoid glands abandoned once more. Yet further irreversible casualties for the Iron Hands. And they're going to be attacked again soon, though not in a physical way this time. They are being assailed by strange visions. Or, well, visions. One of the serfs that have been brought down to the planet and is sleeping has a nightmare. A Pretty damn extreme nightmare, really, where he feels as if if he if he looks upon the thing that is invading his mind, he is likely going to go completely insane, or even worse, it might possess him somehow. It's a rather vivid description of the nightmare, which is, again is rather chaosy. Uh, meanwhile, the two Iron Hands, Atticus and Galba, have a conversation where similar concerns are raised, but rather than dreams, it is mentioned that the the planet tastes wrong. <laughs> I know the planet tastes wrong is um. An interesting opinion, to put it mildly, yet the way it is described is it tastes of shadow. <laughs> I mean, I get what he's he's getting at. He the the planet is wrong. It's incorrect. It it's not supposed to be this way. It's not supposed to feel this way. It's not supposed to taste or sound this way. It's not supposed to be sensed in this way. It comes to the point that he is overwhelmed with a vision of sorts, which he vehemently denies by claiming that I am not a psyker, I am not a psyker. So whatever he's experiencing must resemble an actual psychic phenomena to him. Hmm. Again, the planet is very weird. It, shortly after this as well, they get a little bit of... Uh, a payoff, and something slightly more negative as well. The Surf is able to resist the siren call of whatever thing had been invading his mind, but another Surf was not so lucky. The Surf who'd had the dream wakes up hearing screams, and he decides, okay, well, I'll, you know, I'll find out who the hell is screaming, and I'll try to calm them down, and he finds a Surf busily ripping his own throat open. Mm-hmm. Righty, oh then. This is, of course, brought up to the superiors of the Iron Hands, who conclude that this must be some kind of stress reaction. I mean, they are, after all, on an extremely hostile planet. A little bit of uh, crazy is to be expected, is it not? And uh, to be fair, that's not the craziest of ideas, is it? Yet, nevertheless... It doesn't really come across as all that convincing. There's something else going on here as well, and Mistress Irefren demonstrates this quite quickly by stating that they have got a um, a target. 
a rather interesting one as well. Now, there is no way that an astropath on a planet like this you know, separated from her instrument, separated from the void, from all of her concentration tools, her astrotelepathic little bubble aboard the ship, etc., should be able to gather much, if any, real data about ships nearby. And yet she says with absolute confidence that not only has she detected two warships, she has figured out their tonnage, their destination, and even their designation. Literal impossibilities. But, well, the promise of vengeance is a little bit too strident for such misgivings to take hold, as one of the two ships is a battle barge by the name of the Caledora which just so happens to be a vessel that the Veritas Ferrum has a long history with. Once it was one of their proudest allies, showing the uh, unusual connection between the Iron Hands and the Emperor's children, but during Istvan it had been the Caladora who had fired upon them. That probably puts a dent or two in the Brotherhood I'm expecting. And so, of course, the potential possibility of going after this target mm, is too tempting. No matter how strange the source of the information might be. Furthermore, the area that the Emperor's children's vessels were heading to appeared to have been custom made for ambush operations. Exactly the kind of situation in which a single Iron Hand strike cruiser might be able to ambush and either severely damage or even outright destroy a numerically superior and qualitatively superior as well Emperor's Children's Force. Exactly the kind of vengeance the Iron Hands have been desperately thirsting for ever since Istvan. And with the impossibly precise information given to them by their mistress Irefren, the Iron Hands were able to lay a net of mines, not guessing or blocking off an area or to guard their flanks or anything, but simply just lay it directly on top of where the enemy vessels would emerge from the wall seeing the immediate destruction of one of the Empress children's escorts, the Infinite Sublime. The second escort, the Golden Mean, was also struck and crippled by mines and the death wash of the Infinite Sublime, before being executed by a single volley from the Veritas Ferrum. Two ships down, and the fight hadn't even started yet, but... The battle barge was an entirely different proposition, and the Veritas Ferrum, even with this surprise, even with the ship weakened by mines and the explosion of its escorts, would not fall in a void duel. But again, armed with such precise knowledge, Atticus had prepared another surprise. One of the many massive rocks in the system had been armed with demolition charges, sending it hurling straight towards the Empress Children battle barge. That... that got their attention, and distracted them from the real threat, which was a volley of boarding torpedoes launched by the Veritas Ferrum, and which bored their way near completely unmolested into the ship. Whereupon they find another enemy almost as terrifying as the moss, a carpet made from people. <laughs> because why not? I mean, hell, it's the Emperor's children. Why not is plenty of a reason in and of itself. So I guess we should simply applaud their um, innovative use of artisans. Instead of taking the people with liberal arts degrees and simply having them lounge uselessly in society, they turned them into fluffy carpets. <laughs> Slightly harsh thing, in my opinion, but... Uh, I have some sympathy for it, I do suppose. Nevertheless, the Emperor's children are not in the right on this particular occasion, no matter how sympathetic their goals might immediately seem. 
The Iron Hands managed to send the ship spiraling down towards a nearby planetoid by the name of Creon. The Kalidora has no way to avoid it locked on its course, and despite unloading everything it's got, including cyclonic torpedoes, into the planetoid, they cannot stop their plunge, as the ship is smashed into a billion pieces upon its airless surface, damning everyone aboard. The Iron Hands, of course, had already left back on their boarding torpedoes. The poor Empress children were still so shocked as to what the hell had happened that they didn't even have the opportunity to destroy the torpedoes after they had dislodged themselves from the Kalidora. And hell, the entire ambush had probably lasted 30 minutes? An hour at the absolute most? Yeah, it was the perfect ambush. Unfortunately, more Empress Children ships were heading in towards the system, and now away from Pethos, Mistress Irefren could no longer sense precisely where they would arrive, or when they would arrive, or how many of them would be there. The temptation to stay and try their luck again was near overwhelming, particularly for the Iron Hand's captain Atticus, who had been able to score a victory. I mean, this would go into the history books, this one right here. And again, the urge to maybe see if they couldn't do that again. Well, Atticus, after having been uh, talked to by his other captains, decided that, all right, okay, right, we will leave, but a slight compromise. Before the Veritas Ferrum departs the system, it would lay another minefield of 200 devices in the rough area that they estimated the enemy would arrive based upon the arrival of the Kalidora and its escorts. And just as they finish laying their mines, the Emperor's Children fleet arrives. The Veritas Ferrum enters the warp, fleeing away from the Emperor's Children, carrying out evasive maneuvers as it does so. The last thing they saw was the Emperor's Children's fleet on a course directly for the minefield. Unfortunately, they were not able to stay and guarantee. Unfortunately, they were not able to stay long enough to make sure that they really would hit them or to see what kind of a damage they did as they carry out an emergency translation into the warp. Just in case. You never know, a lucky land strike might sear out from the Emperor's children's vessels and strike the Veritas right as its void shields goes down to bring the Geller fields up. Best not to risk it, they'd already been pushing their luck quite considerably by the deployment of the minefield. On their way back to Pithos, the fleet ran into yet further complications, as several members of the crew simply up and died for unnatural reasons. Particularly the psychically active parts of the crew felt as if they were heading into a very bad place. This sensation was so pronounced that even those without psychic talents felt as if they were heading in the wrong direction, whilst yet others, of course, were feeling the temptation of heading towards it. The psychers in particular needed to steal their nerves so that they could resist any traps the planet or whatever abnormality upon it threw up in their way. The Space Marines, of course, figured that all of this was worthwhile. Yes, it was a little bit dangerous, but considering the possibility for revenge, it was absolutely worth it. And it turns out quite a lot of people apparently thought it was worth it, as when the Ferrum Manus, Ferrum Manus, the Veritas Ferrum, why did they have to name it the Ferrum? When the Veritas Ferrum returns in the system, they find one hundred civilian vessels, which are apparently in such absolute states of disrepair that they appear as if they flew off a scrap heap. All right. Interesting. The planet clearly has some kind of direct 
pull on people then, to the point that they are willing to throw away all safety or even hope of survival, to crash their ships into the planet. <laughs> A ridiculously dangerous procedure, obviously, and even the vessels that survive the uh, landing, quote unquote, will never fly again. And even if there was some hope that they could potentially get off the planet, well, the civvies then set fire to the engine compartments. Though in a very controlled manner, so as to not breach the plasma reactors, mind you, so... Oh, okay. Alright. There is some serious cray-cray going about here. Some really genuinely serious crazy. Only made more crazy by the arrival of the 8 metre tall T-Rexes, which begin gobbling up the hundreds of thousands of civilians. The meal is going to take a while, days, maybe even weeks, but sooner or later they'll have eaten them all, as the civvies have next to no weaponry whatsoever with which to defend themselves. Yet, despite their obviously suicidal position, the civilians begin celebrating. Right. You know, I'm feeling like we're starting to enter into Cthulhu. 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 Good God. Cthulhu. Territory. Cthulhu territory here, where the only real gist of the thing appears to be crazy shit, yo. Be creeped out. Very well. The Iron Hands look upon the Charnel House and think to themselves. Eh, not our problem. And fly away! <laughs> of course, when Captain Atticus carries out the briefing on the location and status of the civilians and their current uh, position in the food chain to the rest of the Astartes, uh, unsurprisingly, Kidem of the Salamanders objects vociferously to simply just leaving the civilians to die at the hands of Thunder Lizards. Weird, that, indeed. And he manages to talk some sense, quote-unquote, into Atticus, who agrees that, all right, fine. I guess we can't just leave them there. And so, albeit a little bit um, hesitantly, the Iron Hands agree to go save as many of the colonists as possible. They land their armour, their company in full strength, hundreds of iron hands, alongside the remnants of the salamanders and the raven guards aboard. And they begin slaughtering the saurosers, with heavy weapons, with vanquish of fire, with thunderhawks, strafing runs, etc. It is a rather one-sided fight, but somehow the jungle resists. It fights back in a semi-organized manner, despite the obvious fact that they have no way of winning this fight, quote-unquote, the Sauroses simply continue to throw themselves at the Imperial lines, even as they are blasted apart by Vindicator shells at point-blank range, they simply refuse to stop coming. And one of the interesting descriptions is that if animals could hate, this is how they would do it. Again, suggesting some kind of guiding intelligence behind the creature's actions. There is also the strange behaviour of the colonists, who uh, don't really act as if they're being rescued. <laughs> Really, at all. They are singing as they march down the corridors of Astartes made for their evacuation. The Iron Hands are not going to coddle them, they're not going to carry them out of the field of battle, they are simply going to provide them with an escape opportunity. And whether or not they take it, well, that is entirely up to them, isn't it? I mean, logical enough, I do suppose. But, again, they're singing. They are still singing. Even as they're getting butchered, even as the space marines around them die whilst trying to save them, they are still singing. 
And after the rescue efforts, the Iron Hands agree that, alright, well, we do have a certain amount of responsibility for these weirdos now, so we are going to create an area for them, and then they are going to have to actually build that area into a safe zone. The Astartes will be nearby, and they will provide some support, some protection, and they will also help them cut down the trees that they will need for the production of their safe zone, but by and large, the civilians are going to be required to build their own little society here on this God Emperor Blighted Death World. <laughs> I mean, again, at, le at least they're giving them some aid, you know, it's, it's, it's something, it's something. The civilians um, are rather obtuse. They seem really happy that they're here and not at all worried about the thousands of them who died horrible, screamy deaths at the hands of enormous T-Rex monsters. They are also quite open about the fact that they are apparently, well, religious. In a way, but not expressly. They, um, what is it? They build a, a building that looks like a temple, but they say that there are no gods here. It's merely a lodge. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a weighted term right now, isn't it? And it is merely a gathering place for them to uh, gather up and talk about the important things happening around their new little colony. And where do they come from? They came from a, uh, a place of lies. How did they get here? On the wings of truth and other such complete and utter gibberish nonsense, skirting the very edge of what the space marines will tolerate. Indeed, uh, questions are even raised to Atticus as to why this is being tolerated at all. All. Why their little lodge building is not torn down. Why the well, civilians themselves aren't denounced as blatant heretics. And he simply says that, well, they're not on a crusade. Yet. <laughs> and they have far more important things to worry about than a bunch of civilians and their backwards ridiculous beliefs. Granted, if the salamanders want to engage in their own little educational playtime, then the Iron Hands won't stop them, but by and large there is a certain distaste directed towards these colonists and their remarkable carefree attitude to everything that's going on around them. Then the Loyalists are attacked once more in the night by the Whispering Shadows. An entire barracks apparently is awoken by nightmares, and those who don't wake up are all speaking the same refrains in their sleep. One of the Space Marines, Galba, is afflicted by a name appearing behind his eyes? Very psychically nonsensey again. And it sounds like a demonic name, and that. This is definitely some kind of bullshitty demon planet, there's no doubt about that. None whatsoever. And if as the hint weren't blatant enough, a ginormous pit opens up right in front of the civilians. Lodge, e.g. temple. And the Space Marines figures, okay, right, a hole open in the ground in front of the Savages Temple. Um, let's, let's go down in it. Why not? Why not? I mean, I think the rational thing would be to close it up, but hey, let's be fair, it would probably just open back up again the next night, wouldn't it? Hmm. The mistress of Ast Astropaths, Ifreti, is also realizing that... This is um, probably something weird going on here, and she is now convinced that what's going on is not merely the presence of the warp. She believes that she is under attack by something, though she's not entirely convinced that this is a... A, a civilization responding to her. She probably has more demonic opinions. She also runs into the surf that runs Atticus's room, the religious surf that has been preaching the Lectitio Divinitatis. This surf tries to convince Irefri, 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 name is weird, that what is going on here is not merely a psychic disturbance, it is not a, a weirdness in the warp or anything like that, it is something unholy, as she puts it. 
She is immediately chastised, of course, for using such silly, outdated religious terminology, but somehow I suspect that the good mistress of astropaths are is going to be um, brought around to the serf's point of view somewhere along the course of this book. Unfortunately, Atticus is not available at the time, and so the mistress is not able to give her warning. Referen is not the only psyker around, however, though that is being kept a fairly tightly guarded secret at the moment, as the Raven Guard, the Tarot, is also a psyker, though a non-practitioning one due to, you know, Nikea and all of that nonsense. Anywho, the Iron Hands venture down into the deep dark hole in the ground, where a non psyker Kalba, apparently receives some kind of a premonition that they are about to be attacked, as they enter into a weird underground structure which none of them is able to understand or discern the purpose for. The closest they get is a suggestion that it is some form of a machine, but this is dangerously close to heresy within the Iron Hands, unsurprisingly, and so the notion is more or less rejected. Not that they have all too much in the way of time to deliberate on the matter, as they are assaulted not by Moss this time, and no, I will not let that go, but instead by a torrent of maggots. Now, how precisely maggots would ever be any kind of a threat whatsoever to space marines, I don't bloody know. <laughs> oh, this is one of those scenes where the book tries to turn into more of a horror novel. It's like they squirm and they squilch and they squelch and things. Yeah, okay, that's cute and all. They're burying us. You're space marines. You have how many hours, days, weeks of air in your suit? You are equipped with a functioning power pack that can keep you alive for God only knows how long. Not to mention the fact that you are retardo strong, even if you're buried, so what? Unless the maggots too are capable of gnawing through power armor, which <laughs> frankly at this point wouldn't uh, actually surprise me all that much. Anywho, they start firing their bolters at the maggots, don't ask me why, and swinging at them with their chain swords instead of simply just going like, huh, that's bloody weird, and walking right back out again, which is eventually what they end up actually doing. They just climb back up the stairs, they escape, and then they send flamer teams down because Atticus has decided that the maggots assault upon his person is a rather insulting thing for them to do, and he wants to fry them now. There is a vivid description of how they, they squilch and pop apparently in the heat. God damn it. <sighs> this is the problem with attempting to do horror in the 41st millennium. It only works so long as you forget the fact that you're talking about the 41st goddamn millennium. The T-Rexes are of course up to their usual nonsense even after they escape the hole. Multiple further holes are discovered and the colonists themselves, still overjoyed about the fact that they are being eaten, are actually going out of their semi-secure compound with the express purpose of looking for more holes. Because batshit insane chaos cultists, essentially. Sadly, the Astartes have, uh, haven't quite developed the term for batshit insane chaos cultists yet, so they are none the wiser. Anywho, let's wrap this one up here, and uh, we'll try to get the rest done in part two. I almost feel like doing a two-parter on this is a waste of time, but I felt it deserved at least a decent look instead of doing a summary, which would probably be five minutes. This is a horror novel, but it doesn't work because it's Space Marines. <laughs> oh well. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Until then, have a good day.